what's going on Wayworld Outreach? Another gorgeous day today in the Spirit of God. We're having a time in His Word. Any day we get to have a time in God's Word is a great day because the Word of God is active and alive and powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. You could swing it both ways and destroy the enemy's kingdom as long as you have the word in your hands, you have the word in your mouth, you have the word all over your house, you got the word playing in your car, you got the word in your mind. Man, this is a tool. This is a weapon. You need this every single day. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, please remember, Proceeds means continually proceeding. You don't just get a word yesterday or two weeks ago. You need a word today. Then you need a word tomorrow. God gives you enough for that day. Remember that. He doesn't give you a word for all the things. He gives you a word for that day. He gives you enough for that day because he wants you to seek him again tomorrow. So guys, Philippians chapter 4, let's worship the, uh, Jesus and invite the Holy Ghost right now <clears throat> because he's the teacher. Lord, we thank you. We invite you right now in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being the teacher of the word. Speak to us what you want us to know. We submit to you right now. God, we intend on changing what you tell us to change. We want to listen for what you say. Amen. All right, people, here we go. I'm going to read right through Philippians 4. Let's get it. Remember, these are overviews. We're not trying to give you every revelation. We want you to hear from God yourself. But we're going to give you an overview about Philippians 4. This is the closing chapter of the book of Philippians. Has it been fun already? Yes, it has. It's been amazing. <clears throat> Verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, therefore. So we know that the therefore comes from what? The previous verses. Remember, 16th century, that's when they wrote chapters and verses. It wasn't until that time. So this was written as one big letter. So let's read the last couple verses of, ver of chapter 3 so we can continue with the thought. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 3. Their destiny and their destruction is in God is their stomach. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. He's beginning to become uh, talking about the people who go by the patterns of the world. Uh, verse 20, but our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. Woo, we could talk about that a long time. We won't right now. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Who's that power? It's not what is that power. Who's that power? His name is the Holy Ghost, the same one that uh, caused him to be able to do all of those things, bring everything under his control, is the same one that will transform our bodies when we go to heaven. That's cool. Verse 1, therefore, of chapter 4, my brothers, <clears throat> you who I love and long for, my joy and my crown, <whistles> that's amazing you can say that about these people, that is, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Verse 2, I plead with uh, Yodia. And I plead with uh, Sintak to agree with each other in the Lord. These are two women. Look at what they did. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellows, is what it says in the NIV. People who are carrying the yoke with them, partners. Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in this book. If you'll study these women, these women are preachers. They're preachers of the gospel. He's literally calling out two women by name who help preach the gospel and change lives. It's all over the Bible, y'all. Wait a minute. Wasn't Paul the one who said that women should remain quiet in church? That same Paul just thanked two women Saying, you guys got to get along. You guys are powerful. Don't let this dissension stop your anointing. Don't let this dissension stop your power. Get in peace. Get in unity. You guys have helped me spread this gospel. You guys are spreading the gospel. There's multiple occasions where Paul points out ministers of the gospel who are women. It's actually the Old Testament as well. Uh, the New Testament. There's, there's so many examples. The word of God is in both men's mouth and women's mouth. Um, just remember, God's a father. If God's a good father, does he really think that a good father is going to tell his daughter, be quiet, you can't use your gifts? 
What are you talking about? No. We're both made in the image of God. We've both been given the power to produce, create, um, produce fruit. Amen? Here we go. Help these women for my cause of the gospel. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again. Rejoice. I love it. He's like, I got to say this twice. Y'all got to rejoice. You need to like make it known how great God has blessed you. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. When? Always. That's right. You got to do it at all times. You got to rejoice because God's good to you. If you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, you're on your way to heaven. You can bring heaven down on earth. God has your back. You are now a child of God. What were you before you got saved? Where were you at before you knew Jesus? You might want to remember that. we got to rejoice, man. This is a day to rejoice. This is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, right? We're not just saying it just so we can be positive. No, 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 no. You need rejoicing in your life. You need to praise. You know the power of praise? <sighs> praise can shake a prison cell at midnight like you did with Paul and Silas. Shake it so that all the chains come off. Praise can take you out of the worst situation of your life. Rejoicing in the midst of hard circumstances is when it counts the most. Rejoicing when it's hard and when you don't want to is when it counts the most. Hebrews says, offer up the sacrifice of praise. Praise is a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice if it's easy. Praise is a sacrifice. What happened when they lit sacrifices? The Bible said the smoke, or in some cases, the incense would go up. And the Bible says it would be a pleasing aroma to God because sacrifice is a pleasing aroma to God. Not things that are easy. It's when you trust him and you say, Lord, I know you're good. I'm going to praise you right now, even though I'm not feeling it. God, I'm thanking you, God, that even in a situation I'm confused about, Lord, I'm going to praise you right now. I'm going to thank you because you're good. You're still on the throne. I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I know one thing. You're the good. You're there. You defeated the devil. You got me. Let's worship and praise him. Amen. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Verse five, for the Lord is near. Guys, that is such a powerful part of this verse. The Lord is near. He's just trying to remind you like, you know, I see everything you're doing. I'm there. I'm in the room. Please be careful how you speak. Remember, I'm there among you. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you're looking at. Be careful what you're listening to. The Holy Spirit is among us. Let's not grieve him, right? Let's be aware. He's there. It's a great thing that he's there. Because that means if we will just turn the inward turn of the heart toward focusing on him and inviting him in, he can manifest himself anywhere. Because he's there, but remember, being omnipresent doesn't mean he's manifested. It just means he's there and available. But we have to unction him to manifest. We have to invite him. We have to actually look at him in the face and say, hey, can you take over the situation, Holy Spirit? That's how he manifests himself. Do not be anxious in anything. Man, this is good. Philippians 4, 6. I've, maybe you know this verse. Use this verse. Don't be anxious about anything in your life, but in everything. In what? In everything. How many things? Everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. That's super key. Present your request to God. In everything that you have, the cure for anxiety is literally right here in the scripture. If you want a cure for anxiety, for uh, terror, fear, uh, for panic, here's your key. You have to, by prayer and petition, what does that mean? You got to, with your mouth, out loud, make your request known to God. Lord, God, I'm really struggling right now with anxiety about my, my daughter. You got to tell him, literally out loud, the situation. Why out loud, Gavin? Doesn't he know our thoughts? Of course he does. But it's not for God that you're saying them out loud. You're saying it out loud for yourself. You need to hear yourself say the things you're anxious about, the things you're nervous about. You got to say it out loud, knowing that you heard it and God heard it. And then you literally hand it over to the Lord. It's like taking a weight in your hands and you give it to him and you take your hands off. 
That's what it means. You say, I'm anxious about this. I'm fearful about this. I'm stressed about this. I don't know what's going to happen with this. I'm not able to sleep well because of this. Whatever. You tell him true. You don't have to sugarcoat any prayers. God handles anything you want to say. He's not intimidated. He can handle it all. You tell him from the truth of your heart. But then you have to leave it with him. How do you do that? Thanksgiving releases it. Man, this is so powerful. You say it out loud, but it's still yours until you thank God ahead of time before it happens. When you say, thank you, Lord, now, God, that I've spoken to you and I've told you this, I'm thanking you that peace is coming now. I'm thanking you right now that, Lord, I'm going to sleep better than I've slept in a long time because, God, I've given this to you. I know the situation isn't resolved yet. I know that the situation might still be happening, but, God, I'm doing what you said. I'm anxious about this, but I'm giving it to you. Now that I know you've heard me, Lord, now that I know that you've heard me, God, I've said it out loud, you've heard me. I'm thanking you, Lord, that I have peace. I'm thanking you, God, that the breakthrough is there. I thank you, God, that you love them more than I love them. What is the situation? Come on, guys. This is super important. Right? And when you thank God, you release it. And then this is what happens. Verse 7. The peace of God, which transcends all, transcends. It means it's higher. It goes above, surpasses, goes higher than all of your own understanding. You're not going to know why you're in peace. You're not going to understand how you have peace in the midst of this crazy situation. You used to be so anxious about this stuff. You always got nervous when this happened. You always lost it. You always got afraid when this person showed up or this situation happened. Your child did this. You were always reacting in panic, but you're not right now. You're not going to understand it, but God's going to be giving it to you. Peace. It passes all understanding. It's going to guard your heart. It's going to guard your mind within Christ. Quick little insight here before we move on. Remember what the book of Proverbs says? It says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. There are many theories of how we guard our heart. Did you recognize that the Bible just told you how? (laughs) Let's read this verse again, verse 7. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So instead of being like, man, I got to guard my heart. I got to guard my heart. I don't got to let anybody in. I'm going to put up walls to everybody. I'm not going to be sensitive anymore. I'm not going to become vulnerable because I got to guard my heart. That's not the answer. Peace guards your heart. So if you want to protect your heart, you have to protect your peace. Do you get that? If you want to guard your heart, you need to guard your peace. Don't let anyone take your peace. Do you know people cannot take your peace? You have to give it to them. It's your choice whether you want to give someone your peace or not. You don't have to give it away. You don't have to give your peace to the guy who just flipped you off on the highway. You honestly don't have to give it away. You don't have to give away your peace to the boss who's treating you like trash. You don't have to give away your peace to your family member who's trying to be whatever. You don't have to give away your peace. You don't got to give it away. It's yours. You can hold on to it. Don't let people take your peace. Don't give it away. Guard your peace. Guard the peace of your home. Don't allow things to come in that's going to come and destroy the peace in your home. Don't allow people to be there and stay there. They're going to destroy the peace of your home. You don't do that. We are responsible for guarding the peace in our life. Therefore, we're guarding our hearts. Finally, brothers, verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. He's like, listen, God's like, I'm going to tell you what to think. And this is really, really important. You understand this right before we read this verse is just by saying I'm not going to have a thought does not heal your thoughts. I'm not going to think that anymore. No, that's not work. That doesn't work. I can't think that. Stop thinking this. Ah, ah, ah. It doesn't work. The only thing that replaces a bad thought is a better thought. I'm going to say that again. The only thing that replaces a bad thought is a better thought. The only thing that replaces a bad idea is a better idea. So Jesus knows that even if you say, "Uh," and you say, get out of my head, stop it. I don't want to think this way anymore. I don't want to act this way anymore. And you remove that, it's still empty space. Empty space in your mind is unclaimed space. 
Unclaimed space in your mind is space that the enemy will try to take every time. I'm going to say that again. Just by displacing a thought doesn't mean it's solved because now it's empty space. Empty space in your mind is still unclaimed space. Unclaimed space is still space for the enemy to take. You have to fill that space with a better thought or a better idea. So Jesus is like, instead of just saying, stop thinking this, he's like, I'm going to give you the thoughts to think. You see how there's an action? He's like, I'm giving you thoughts to replace those bad thoughts. I'm giving you better thoughts. I'm going to replace your bad idea with better ideas. And here they are. Think on these things. He's literally like, you have to purposefully think this way. Intentionally point your mind toward things that are noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You got to be intentional to therefore find things that are noble and think about them. Find things that are right, get the truth, think about it. Find things that are pure, get away the filth, think about pure things. Find things that are lovely, go find them, discover them, get lovely things in the eyes of God, admirable things, excellent things, praiseworthy things. Think about those. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice. Don't just listen to me. Don't listen to, to this overview right now and be like, man, that was, hopefully that was good. Thanks, Gavin. No, like, what is God saying to you? You need to put it into practice. You need to take it to the next level, right? Amen. And the God of peace will be with you. He's going to help you all the way around. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned but you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11, I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever circumstances I'm in. Wow, this is a powerful lesson. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in both of them, when I have a lot, when I don't have a lot. I've learned the secret to being content in every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Jesus who gives me strength. You see what he just said? I've learned the secret. What's the secret? I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. The secret is because Jesus is always with me and I know how to invite him into a situation I can get through anything. Do you know how valuable the pearl of great price is? His name is Jesus. Do you know how valuable he is? He's in your life. If you're a believer, he's right here. He's here through his spirit and the Holy Spirit. Have you valued him? Have you talked to him? Have you invited him in to come into the places you feel lack? Have you thanked him for the plenty that you might be having in abundance right now? Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Verse 15, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Let's just hear what he just said. <laughs> not one church gave financially to Paul except the church at Philippi. This preacher, Paul, goes everywhere to share the gospel. Nobody gave him anything financially. He was a tent maker, so he was providing for himself, providing food for himself, providing clothes for himself. Everything he needed, Paul had to work for and preach on top of it every day. Nobody gave him anything financially except these people. Now watch what happened. Watch what happens when you financially put a seed into a ministry that has a harvest. Watch this, when it's a good harvest. For even when I was there in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. They sent him financial help again and again. 
Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. Number one, when you give financially, because finances matter to all of us, whether we want to act like they do or not, don't be too super spiritual for money. Finances matter. That's what you work for. It's why you work. So you can provide for your family. You do all the things you need. Finances matter. He says that when you give a financial seed into a harvest, into a field that's ripe, that, that's supporting the gospel, he says what happens is it's going to be credited to your account in heaven. So God sees your gift and he says, I'm going to count that to their account in heaven. I'm going to count that to be able to give them rewards in heaven. And watch this. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you have sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Giving financially is a sacrifice. It is an offering not for man, for God. Let me say that again. When you give financially into the work of the Lord, it's not an offering to man. It's an offering to God himself. And it is a sacrifice and it pleases him. And then here comes this famous, famous verse that we all quote. But honestly, we quote it out of context. I just read you the people that Paul is talking to. The people who gave to him financially, who partnered with him, who went to the next level. Didn't just listen to his preaching and let him go. But these people, these people, this next verse is for. This verse is not for everybody. This verse is not for everybody in the church. It's for only people who actually partner financially in service and in vision with a ministry. He says this, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He's not going to meet everybody's needs according to his grace. Don't you know that? Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean he's going to meet all your needs. Hello, believers. He doesn't just meet your needs because you have the title of a Christian. You could still be living like a lost person. You could still be serving the devil, but you went to church and you said a prayer at an altar. Guys, these are for people. This promise, my God will supply all of your needs. These are people who have dedicated to the vision, the great commission, God's kingdom, who are planted in it in three ways. This is how you're planted. Your vision becomes its vision, that your vision. His vision becomes your vision. Number two, you serve with your time. Number three, you serve with your finances. These people, God's going to make sure he's got your back all the time. He's going to provide all your needs according to whose riches? His riches. It's not the bank account down the street. It's not ThinkWise Credit Union. It's not uh, Wells Fargo. No, it's God's riches. The kingdom of God's riches, God's riches. He's got a lot of riches. To our God and Father, forever and ever, amen. Final greetings. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me sending greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Ooh. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you and your spirit. Amen. Let me say this, guys. Remember what grace is. Grace is God's empowerment. It's not just a covering for your sin. It's the power of God. It's His ability that goes beyond your ability in order so that you can accomplish what he's asking. I'll say it again. Grace is his ability, which goes beyond your limited ability so that you are able to do what he is asking you to do in your life. It helps you accomplish the will of God because without his help, we can't do it. That's why he gives us grace, the ability to go beyond our own ability to accomplish his will. I bless you with that this week. I bless you with that grace. Just like Paul says, I extend it out to you. We're in agreement today. Have a great time studying this word bit by bit as you go through your growth book. And uh, God bless you. Share this with people. Uh, be blessed. Amen. Bye.